So, the next step. Some people have actually asked me, so what do these bottom two tracks do? This one that says none game object and it's green and it's got a tick, you can probably have a very good guess what that does. This one called a control track, which is a bit more ambiguous in what it does and what it actually controls and what these clips set, say. So these are two built-in tracks into timeline. The, the first one, the green one, is an activation track. It's very, very simple in that you bind it to an object and when you have a clip, it will basically turn off the object and when you reach the clip, it will turn it on and then for the duration it'll be on and then it will turn it off. So a good example of this is let's say a cutscene and a dragon flies over and then you want to appear the dragon's name underneath like a Zelda boss or something like that. You can use the activation track to say turn on this UI for this duration and then turn it off at the end. So you can use it to turn on and off different objects. The activation track, you're setting the active state of the object. The second one is a control track. This is a bit more ambiguous. So the control track doesn't have a binding, but on the clip it's got a whole, hang on, sorry. On the clip it's got a whole load of different settings, uh, such as post playback and particles and stuff like this. And the control track's purpose is to basically sequence anything that happens over time. So one being a particle system. So if you wanted, let's say, a lightning strike to take place and you want to scrub through that lightning strike, you can create a control track bind it to the particle system, and then you can position that lightning strike on the timeline. So say at this point, a lightning strike will take place because it's something that happens over time. And of course, the duration matters as well because you can change the length of each of the clips. Another thing that the control track can do is actually can control over time another timeline. So we have here this intro cutscene where the camera flies through and does different things. And we have this other timeline that goes three, two, one, go. And some people who have gone into play mode will actually notice that both these things play exactly the same time. So you'll see here, it's counting down three, two, one, go, and you're like, oh, wow, okay, so I should be racing whilst this <laughs> dolly track is playing. And then I can actually still drive the car around, like, yeah. Now you obviously don't want that to happen. You want this intro cutscene to be nice camera shot, nice little fly through, nice little pan down, and then in this clip here, this to be the three, two, one, go. So we're not nesting it. We're not nesting a timeline, so another timeline. We're kind of saying, at this point, play this other timeline at this point. It's generally good practice to break your timelines into lots of little timelines. And if you use After Effects, has anyone here used After Effects a lot? It's kind of like having a composition, you put a composition sequenced by another composition as well. You can break it into little chunks, which is kind of what we've done. Now, if I was to select this control playable asset, You'll notice here that in the clip it says, what is the source game object? This could be a particle system, this could be another timeline, it could be anything that happens over time. I'm going to select the target. Then in here we have assets in the scene. So we have this 3, 2, 1 countdown is an object in our scene. So I select scene. Now, because we can select any game object, I then have to filter it. This is a, a common gotcha here. If you don't click over to scene and you type countdown under assets, you're going to be grabbing the prefab that's in your project folder. It's not going to work. And you're going to wonder why, because it looks like you have countdown uh, UI there. So you have to be sure you grab the one in the scene. If you don't trust yourself to click that scene tab first, just drag the one from your scene onto there. Um, but yeah, definitely be sure you click the scene one and not the one that's in your assets folder. Remember that you have that countdown UI prefab, and it's not going to sequence that because it's just an asset in your project folder, not actually in your scene. So click countdown UI. Now if I scrub through, Okay, we still have the lap times, but don't worry about that because remember that script clears those and, and sets the string to null. Then as we get to this point, hey look, we have that three, two, one, go countdown. And if I was to move this, so I, I drag this here, you could actually set it up. So you can actually sequence and position this three, two, one, go. You could have another cutscene that takes place like in another level with uh, different dolly tracks and embeds that three, two, one, go there. So you have that one, same one countdown, but across multiple scenes, multiple timelines. And this is where it gets a little inception-y, I'll be honest. You have timelines within timelines within timelines within timelines. We must go deeper. Yes. So we still have that three, two, one, go. And if I went into play mode, I could still drive the ship around. And remember what Mike said at the beginning, we had the game manager, the coroutine, which initializes itself and then plays. Well, we don't want the player to start driving around, you know, at the beginning of the game during this intro cutscene. We want it to turn on a certain point. So with this activation track, we can then set the binding of this activation track to be, and again, in the scene, the game manager. 
And as I scrub through here, you'll probably notice here that the game manager is now turned off. It's a little bit faint, but you can see it doesn't have the same sort of color blue. It's kind of like, uh, faded out blue. And then when I scrub and get to that activation clip, it's then going to turn on that game manager and initialize the player's input. And the reason why we do it at this point here is because in a typical racing day game, we don't wait until go fades out and then go. It goes three, two, one, and then on go, then uh, the race begins. So you see three, two, one, and then I've already lined this up at this point. Go. You can see that this clip is already at that exact point for go, and then the race begins. So it's a very simple step. There's two things. So if I now show you kind of the end thing. With no audio? I believe they just have it muted up there. Okay. They didn't like the song. That's fine. It's all right. Oh, thank you. Ah. So we have the intro cutscene showing off the environment, typical to uh, racing game. And at this point, and again, I can try and hit the arrow keys and I can't drive. And notice that the game manager also handles the lap time. And of course, 1.6 seconds, I beat the time again. Fantastic. And then we have that cutscene there. It kind of seems silly that I took 27 seconds when you did it in 1.6. Who's to say? Cool. And you can race around. And then when it reloads the scene, it will reload that same intro cutscene uh, timeline. So, very simple. On this activation track, which is the one with the green tick, set the game manager. That's the scene game manager, not the asset prefab game manager. And then on the control track, on the clip, set the countdown UI, and that's the scene countdown UI, not the asset countdown UI. It's literally two things. Now, you could position things around, but those are the only two things that you have to set.